Um, okay, awesome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for for joining. Um, you know, the virtual meetups are still maybe a little weird for us. Um, luckily, this month we have a really really exciting speaker. Um, uh, so uh, Andrew Godby here uh, from U Group. He's going to talk to us a little bit about IoT and edge computing. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, at the top, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Selectus. Selectus is a company that I work at. Um, we kind of usually host and, and sponsor the the DC Data Engineering Meetup. Um, we can talk a little bit about the Data Engineering Meetup, and then Andrew, I will give you a really rousing intro to get everyone psyched up for your presentation. Um, so, uh, Selectus is a DC-based tech company. Um, we, we are uh, currently located in Shaw, although we'll see after this uh, apocalyptic period blows over where we, <laughs> where we land in the city. Um, so we built, this, we built this platform called Ma uh, Magpie. Um, it allows people to manage their data lake in a really kind of simple way, which is not something that uh, is really out there right now. Um, data lakes are a great way to centralize your analytics, especially if you're a really large company and you're storing a lot of large data. Um, uh, Magpie helps data engineers move faster and get better. Um, the results are clean um, and there's a lot of really great automated features in there as well. Uh, for more information, reach out to me, uh, go to select.is, um, find us on LinkedIn. Uh, we'd be happy to talk. Um, so. I don't know if I can do a show of hands on this, but if you're new to DC data engineering, basically we've been in operation for about uh, a year now. Um, we've had really cool speakers. Um, it, we we kind of saw that there was a bit of a void in the, the, the sort of meetup space for um, specifically data engineering and also uh, seeing the kind of what is the where is the kind of industry going? I guess is the way I would put it. Uh, what are what are what are experienced practitioners doing right now? Um, and getting stories of instead of clean, nice, um, you know, out of the box environments. What are the kind of like um, blemished, weird legacy stories about taking some old uh, some old uh, data warehouse and converting it to something modern and making it work. Um, so yeah, uh, if you if you um, have any feedback, we actually have uh, on our meetup page a survey if you want to fill that out. Um, and we would love to hear from you. So just uh, reach out. Uh, also, if you'd like to speak, I believe there's also a form that you can fill out on the meetup page as well. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, so tonight. Um, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Andrew Gabi here. Um, he is a data scientist, he is an engineer, he's an all around brilliant, brilliant man. Um, he uses his deep experience in computer science and engineering to be very uh, thoughtful and creative uh, working at U Group. Um, Andrew, uh, he has diverse interests, aptitude uh, for both theory and practice, uh, which is enabled to work including wearable sensor networks, uh, plasma physics instrumentation, computer vision, uh, fast topic modeling for survey analysis, and supply chain link analysis. Um, with each technical challenge, Andrew has been passionate about finding simple and scalable methods to enrich user understanding and experience of data. As both a successful team member and team leader, Andrew recognizes that the best ideas and solutions come from collaboration, at U Group, Andrew uh, uh, serves as a catalyst and accelerator for projects, uh, works with teams to bring creative and innovative solutions to end use. Um, and with all that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Andrew, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much, Brandon. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to attempt to successfully share a screen again. And All right, did I succeed? I can see it, yeah. Okay, perfect, great. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, we will be talking about um, applications to IoT and edge computing 
using Python. Uh, we're going to be focusing on, uh, on real-time computation. And yeah, I did say Python. <laughs> um, it's not probably what people would think of when going for uh, computational efficiency and parallelization and uh, real-time applications. But in this case, um, it proved uh, to be um, the perfect tool for the job. So I'll start with a little bit of background first on what the project is, what the context is um, about the technology under the hood here. Um, we were tasked with creating a real-time audio analyzer and visualizer. We had to deploy this system in a uh, theatric environment and uh, have this run during a live performance. So uh, everything had to just work. We only had one computer and in this environment there was uh, no internet access, no connection. So whatever device we walked in with had to be the thing that did everything. So as we are creating, um, backing up a sec, the goal is to listen to incoming audio streams, music, and analyze that in real time, and then create visual representations of that data and various transformations of that data to create a uh, seamless experience connecting uh, audio and visual. The image that you have there on the slide isn't a random image that is a, a capture of one of our real-time streams. Um, the bright lines you see, this is a, a um, spectrogram computed with a short time Fourier transform. And the bright lines show energy at different uh, frequencies. So uh, going left to right is time, uh, bottom to top is pitch uh, going from lowest to highest. So at the very bottom of that image there, those traces you see, you can kind of visualize um, a baseline in music. Uh, and the brighter lines that seem to echo one another up top, that's the melody plus the harmonics. So it's pretty cool to, to uh, hear the music and then see the music and see that connection and have that all happen together um, in a live performance. So I, I, I know I was just introduced. I'm not gonna be belabor this, but um, a little bit more on why I'm interested in IoT and edge computing and why I think it's a really um, great next frontier in, in data engineering and data science. Um, so in the past, I've worked on a couple of um, similar uh, applications on that little image on the right there is a, is a, um, a microcontroller and circuit that I built. And uh, that was a, a component of a wearable wireless sensor network. That one, its purpose was to translate uh, movement of a dancer into uh, music and control signals in real time. Um, and again, without connection to an external computer, we had, um, uh, um, I think we used 32-bit microcontrollers here, so we weren't you know, crazy in using 8-bit ones. But in any case, the analysis had to be done with bare minimum resources. Um, on the left, there's an image that's a capture of a, um, <clears throat> a what's the right word for this? It's an interactive audio installation that was at the Contemporary Jewish Museum of San Francisco in uh, 2011. Um, this was an installation where a single camera was installed and in real time we were detecting um, uh, people. Those are the um, weird blobs you see. Those are the detected uh, people moving around the space. Um, and we translated that again in real time to um, positions in space. We had a very cool speaker system provided by Meyer Sound um, that allows us to position sound in space by controlling the phase difference between speakers. It's, it's some pretty cool magic. Um, so we were creating a, an embodied experience of sound in that um, really beautiful space. Um, so I'm very passionate about the idea that we can be doing 
computer vision and machine learning and uh, all sorts of deep analysis uh, on small devices with limited resources. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes. So anyway, that was my motivation for um, really digging into this kind of technology. <clears throat> so the rest of this talk, I'm going to start by giving you a, more of an overview of the constraints of this project um, that will motivate the system design. So we've made a bunch of um, uh, key design decisions that I think and I hope you will find um, interesting um, for your future work. And then we will go into a little bit of, of details for that solution in this particular context of the audio analysis um, with the hope that that will um, provide some uh, ideas of what can come next. Um, so with that, let's take a look at the constraints. So once again, we had a system where there was no access to the internet. So we had no cloud, uh, no other sensors. Every computation had to be done on the same device that was uh, sensing the sound in the room. So the, the audio stream was coming into the same device that was doing all the computation. Um, we also uh, did not have access to the performance space or a realistic proxy of a live performance space in advance of, uh, of this actually running. Um, so this is an unknown environment. We can't create uh, training data. We can't uh, get, um, tune this precisely to what we would expect to hear. The solution has to be um, flexible and general enough to work anywhere. Um, and finally, low latency. So we're taking audio signals and, uh, and transforming them into a visual representation. And we want that connection between audio and visual to be uh, seamless. So to not notice that, um, the analyses need to uh, run at around 30 frames per second. So um, ideally, uh, the uh, people in the audience would hear music and see immediately a representation of that music that makes sense. Um, so latency there is um, a big motivator for um, some of these design decisions. <clears throat> um, where I think there are applications for what I'm going to discuss um, are subsets of IoT and edge computing. So in robotics, if you've got a small uh, a fleet of small robots, um, all their sensing of their local environments, all their computation and decision making, that all has to happen locally on their device. Um, wearables, uh, embedded intelligence, where, I mean, I'm wearing a wearable right now, um, and they're really proliferating. And um, again, uh, every person is different and how people wear devices is different. And so the environment, as I said um, before, for our solution was um, uh, unpredictable and we didn't know it in advance. Uh, I think that's very much the case as well for, for wearable devices. Um, I have the Raspberry Pi logo there because that is um, a picture of a Raspberry Pi. Um, most recent um, <clears throat> iterations uh, actually have multiple cores in their processor. So again, some of what I will describe um, could potentially be run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I have not tried, but I am hoping somebody will, um, either myself or somebody else, um, because I think it'd be really, uh, really cool to see this kind of uh, uh, sensory visualization um, with a, uh, a minimal device. Um, and then sensor networks. Um, when we have a bunch of cheap sensors that we're scattering around cities, perhaps, um, trying to understand um, air quality or um, the environment or um, traffic patterns. Um, these networks are ad hoc. They're trying to, each node is trying to find its neighbor nodes and establish communication. 
communication in internet access is unreliable in those cases. And it's very important that these complex signals that are being analyzed, uh, that those signals be compressed and um, the, the interesting aspects, the modeling needs to happen locally so that what is transmitted, the useful information that is transmitted through the network is uh, really just focused on the results. So then, why Python? Um, I alluded to that before as being perhaps a um, curiosity. Um, in this case, uh, it was due to the abundance of libraries and the uh, vibrant communities around these, uh, these technologies. Uh, Librosa is one of the audio analysis libraries that we used. They do have some really amazing uh, functions and analyses that um, uh, really made possible the kinds of visualizations that we were creating. Um, NumPy and of course SciPy and uh, Scikit-Learn, um, these are the uh, core of, of uh, numerical and scientific computing and um, data scientists have gravitated to Python um, in large part due to uh, the existence of these libraries. And it's not, well, it's not just the library because Python, the language uh, is, is uh, um, easy to read, easy to write, fast to iterate with. And with NumPy, the, all the routines are implemented in, in C and, and Fortran. So the subroutines are running basically on bare metal. They're super fast. Python, the Python part is really just a wrapper. Um, and then of course, there's the possibility of using um, uh, pre-trained models. Um, since we don't have access to training data, if we found pre-trained models from model zoos online, from PyTorch or Keras or whatever, we would have access to that. Ultimately, we didn't use those. Um, what we found in Librosa was um, uh, effective enough for our purposes, but that is still um, certainly an, an option. So all of that led to uh, rapid development cycles for us. Uh, we had a lot of options uh, and we came into this project with no a priori solution, nothing out of the box. And we had, I think it was just two months to create this entire thing and make it work. So speed and agility was essential. But uh, there's a potential problem with Python, um, which is the global interpreter lock or GIL. Uh, this is an issue with CPython, uh, the most commonly used uh, uh, implementation of Python's interpreter. Uh, it's not thread safe. So parallel processing is uh, not so smooth uh, with, with Python. So since it's not thread safe, uh, what do we do? Uh, the first piece of the solution to put out there is async IO. Um, I am curious later to see how many people know of async.io before this talk. Um, that would be a useful <laughs> calibration. Um, <clears throat> so forgive me if this is too redundant, but um, async.io is a relatively new uh, aspect of the standard library in Python. And it enables uh, event-driven programming and it has an event loop, allows you to implement coroutines and does a really great job of uh, balancing um, I.O. tasks that might take a while to return and uh, heavy computation uh, so we can create a responsive system. Now, in Python 3.7, a lot of enhancements were uh, released for async I.O. that makes it very easy to, uh, to program as well. Uh, new keywords were introduced into the language and um, a lot of performance enhancements were added under the hood. So um, async IO ended up being a key enabler for this project. Add to that the existence of AIO libs, which is an environment of uh, libraries that uh, do common tasks like, um, like uh, web communication and um, uh, database access, 
with async IO's event loop. So they're um, out of the box compatible. So I'm alluding to this goal that we need flexible multiprocessing here. The problem being we've got too many jobs for a single Python interpreter. Uh, we've got uh, this microphone, which is representing um, the audio input process. We've got the different bar graphs, which are separate analyses that we're trying to run. The uh, monitor, because we're creating visualizations out of those analyses, and a keyboard, because we need to uh, accept human input to start the system, to stop the system, to adjust parameters. Um, and with that conflict between I.O. and CPU tasks, uh, this just melts. This, uh, uh, this does not work. So what do we do? Well, try more Pythons. Um, that's my glib solution. Um, but this is ultimately the approach that we take. So um, we have a separate interpreter for uh, listening to the audio and uh, creating an audio buffer. Um, separate interpreter for reading an audio buffer and analyzing it, um, et cetera. So obviously we need to communicate between those processes. So in order to do that, the first piece here in this diagram is this buffer. We use a, a memory mapped file, uh, thanks to NumPy, and um, we take audio buffers or uh, chunks of audio data in real time and write them to this memory mapped file. Uh, separate processes can then read that same file and uh, again, as a memory mapped array and efficiently grab that buffered audio data and do its analysis. Um, its results can then be passed along to visualization. This begs the question, how does all this communication happen? And this is the other part of the solution that I think is um, really critical here. Um, we're using Redis here, which is an in-memory data structure store. Uh, it can be used as a database, can be used as a cache, can be used as a message broker. Um, it can be used in the cloud. Um, it is often used in similar ways like uh, Kafka to be a message broker. Um, in this case, we can run it locally because it is lightweight, it is efficient, and it's basically zero config. You can, uh, at least on my Mac, um, start it up in the background and just run with it. It's, <laughs> um, it's fantastic. It really enabled us to uh, have indep independent modules that all communicate seamlessly with one another through a, a publish and subscribe uh, model. Um, it allowed us to develop individual components like microservices. So that allowed us to uh, develop things modularly, uh, uh, iterate rapidly so individual modules could be uh, upgraded without impacting the rest. And the other nice feature is uh, there is a, a library compatible with async IO for a Redis client. So that just works. It's awesome. So now we're going to talk about some of the engineering details that was uh, some of the key design components. Now some details about how we use it all together. And first touching on the audio input. Um, getting that sensor data is the first step. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm pausing here because I'm not exactly sure if my gestures with a mouse will be legible. Um, so I'm going to just hope, <laughs> go out on the limb here. Okay, so we've got- We, we, can, we can see them. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> so we've, we've got the, the, um, uh, this microphone here representing a, a streaming audio um, process. So a, a Python interpreter that is dedicated to listening to the audio stream. And we're using Pi Audio for that. Um, Pi Audio, um, every time it collects a, a chunk of some length of data, so some number of samples, 
it packages it up and sends a callback. And um, in that case, in this case, we are uh, sending that chunk into uh, the memory mapped buffer here. Um, the left hand side is the most recent data and whatever uh, is the most recent data pushes the rest of the data to the right. And this buffer is a fixed width. We set the width in advance that makes sense for the application. This is real time. So data that is too old is going to be relevant. So we're going to just let it drop. <clears throat> so at the same time that the audio process is uh, sending the callback and adding the data into the buffer, it can send a message, publish a message on uh, a Redis channel that we named audio, um, to be perfectly clear, and simply alert analysis processes that, hey, there's new data and it was collected at this timestamp. So it may be relevant for you. And it is then up to the analysis modules to, uh, to decide if they need that data or not. Um, and then periodically they will read from that same buffer and grab that data, do the analysis and publish the results uh, on another Redis channel. Uh, I want to touch briefly on the um, audio data format, um, a little bit about Pi Audio. There's a little terminology confusion here that I'm hoping to avoid. The, <clears throat> the audio stream has, uh, in, in the machine we used, had, had two channels. It had a left and a right. Some audio setups will have five channels, some just one. but in this case, we had a, a left and right channel, and the audio is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz. So there's 44,100 samples every second. Uh, so the dots you see there are um, representing samples of an audio feed. Those individually are floats. <clears throat> now, Pi Audio will collect a number of those uh, pairs of samples, sorry, they call a frame one sample uh, combined across all the channels. So in this case, a frame is actually two numbers, one for the sample in the left channel, one for the sample in the right channel. It will package up a number of those frames and then fire its callback. Um, it's a parameter how many frames you want per buffer, but um, in this case, we decided on uh, 1,470 so that we'd be firing the callback 30 times per second, given that was our target um, frame rate. There's the confusion there. So um, the frame with a capital F there in 30 FPS is relative to the, the visual target. The lowercase f frame in Pi Audio is representing um, the, the, their data structure for an individual audio sample across all its channels. So a little bit of code. I'm, I'm not going to show a ton of code, at least I hope it feels that way. Um, but in some cases, I think it's uh, helpful to see um, what's going on. So Pi Audio, I said, is what we're using to, to grab the, the audio signal. Um, we are setting that a single value, a single float is going to be represented by two bytes. That's another parameter Pi Audio can handle. We collapsed the two channels to a single channel. Uh, so Pi Audio behind the scenes does some averaging to do that. Uh, told it to do 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. Uh, configured this stream as an input only, not an output. We weren't controlling speakers, we were controlling visuals and frames per buffer 1,470, that would get us our target frame rate of 30 um, callbacks per second. Um, so the callback piece is um, what we'll focus on here for a sec, because Pi Audio doesn't use async IO. It's uh, got a different asynchronous uh, programming model. It's using uh, callbacks. So the question is, how do we make them compatible? <clears throat> This snippet shows how you can interleave the two 
And in purple, I've highlighted the async IO components and in pink, the Pi Audio components. So we have um, at, at the front, at, uh, sorry, at the top, we've got this uh, async IO event loop that we're naming loop. We pass it to this main coroutine, um, and now it's called event loop. And we've defined the audio stream and its callback inside this coroutine. So uh, the callback has access to the async IO event loop. So inside the callback, we can create a new task for the async IO event loop to handle. And that task says, uh, publish that event on Redis. So um, that looks like, like this uh, <laughs> top line here, uh, async def publish event. Um, so this is using AIO Redis, Redis's um, uh, async IO client to publish a message. Uh, so it ends up being rather simple and straightforward if you just use the right pattern. Um, then we need to get that data to the, uh, the analysis modules. And in order to do that, we're using shared memory. Um, so this is an example of how you do that. So in memory, we're creating this init buffer, which initializes an array of data in memory. Um, this buff object here is creating the uh, memory mapped file named audio data to be completely obvious what it is. And um, its shape is the same as the, uh, the buffer that we've created in memory. And then the last line just says, okay, let's take that in memory data that we've initialized and write that to the buffer. So then the memory mapped file is populated initially with all zeros. <clears throat> in, back in the um, Pi Audio callback, the, um, this diagram, or sorry, this code block is showing how we are adding data to the beginning of the buffer and pushing the other data out. So um, this buff data value is doing some pre-processing with Librosa just to scale values between negative one and one. Um, then the next line here um, is get, uh, taking a, a view into all but the last chunk of the in-memory buffer. Then the next line takes that view and writes it back to the buffer shifted over uh, and then takes the new data and puts it up front. Um, so visually, we end up with this, this diagram that um, I showed before, where we take that uh, chunk of data from, the, from um, Pi Audio's callback, and we write it into this buffer, pushing the other data to the right. Now, signal analysis. Um, I want to pause really briefly to um, just do a time check, uh, see how long I should hear this uh, signal analysis piece for. You are at 6.36, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Usually, so, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, usually uh, folks will, will stick around for about an hour before they start uh, clamming for margaritas, <laughs> but- um, Okay. I mean, this um, is pretty interesting so far, Andrew. <laughs> so. Cool. Very good. Um, I, I will proceed um, without too much uh, shame. <laughs> um, OK, so we did a lot of different analyses. And over the course of development and experimentation, we, uh, we had to be swapping analyses in and out, tweaking their parameters, et cetera. This is just going to show you an example of a couple of them. So um, on the left, we've got a beat detection module um, thanks to Librosa, which is uh, trying to identify downbeats in music. That's actually a grab from one of our uh, demo notebooks that was uh, exploring this functionality. Uh, CQT is a type of uh, spectrogram that is tuned to uh, the piano keys. That's why you see C3, C4, C5, etc. Those are relative to piano keys. So this transform is geared towards extracting the notes that are being played in the music. 
Um, and again, that's a real screen grab there. Um, the next is just the picture of a metronome um, to represent tempo estimation. Uh, that uses the output of beat detection to estimate uh, the, um, the tempo of the music. So um, maybe the beats per minute is um, at uh, 100 beats per minute in, in one part of a song and then um, gets intense and goes up to 140 later. Um, this allows us to, to see um, how rapidly these beats are coming. So one of the, the main components of our design here is to make sure that the modules are, um, can be plugged in, swapped out, and development can be relatively independent. So in this case, before we begin with the design of the, uh, of the analysis itself, we create a contract and it's basically defining what our API is. So beat detection we're saying is going to create a, a certain kind of message on a beat detection channel on Redis. So if anybody's interested in that data, all they need to do is subscribe to that channel and they will get uh, the latest and greatest from Redis. So in this case, maybe we pass along timestamp, the duration of the data chunk that's being passed along as the message, the sampling rate and the raw data itself of the analyzed output. <clears throat> that contract can then be used to uh, develop an algorithm to estimate tempo. Um, and those two can be worked on in parallel. We can decouple the requirements between the two and um, iterate more rapidly. One challenge, one final detail about the data that's uh, ignored so far is the different requirements of the different uh, analysis routines. Um, some analyses um, don't require very much computation. Others um, require a lot. So the latency in their accepting data and returning a result can be very different. Um, also, the requirements for historical data can differ. Um, some routines might just need the past, um, the past, you know, half a second in order to get uh, the right kind of results for the visualizations we want to create. Others, you might need uh, five, 10 seconds. And so the, the memory mapped uh, buffer that we created in the first place, that is sort of the, the common denominator. That is the most data that you will ever need for any of your analyses. Um, on the left here um, and on the right, we've got uh, different examples showing uh, Maybe an analysis just needs uh, two chunks uh, and at a time another needs four chunks. Um, there might be some overlap in those windows of, their, of the data in subsequent calls, or there might not be. Um, the leading edges, the left-hand edges of the boxes are kind of representing um, how often the um, analysis routine is called. Um, so those, the, it all gets sort of intertwined there. Um, so there's different window widths, there's different uh, sliding window step sizes, different latency and update frequency. They all kind of interrelate, but it's all the same data and uh, we can make it work. So orchestrating all of this, um, we have a, a central dispatcher. Uh, this is a crude visual representation. I'll show you code of the same thing in the next slide. This is showing the, um, the, the larger box is the central script that launches everything else. So we have one point of contact for controlling the whole system. And that process creates the other sub-processes and 
lets them run independently, but keeps a handle on their process IDs. And at the end, whenever the main script is told to terminate, it before, before it does, it sends kill signals to all the sub-processes and cleans everything up. So the central dispatcher in code looks like this, where the dispatch coroutine at the top uh, has this list of procedures and um, async IO allows you to really easily create sub-processes um, like this. And um, we return that list of, of uh, sub-processes and in, uh, in the main loop at the bottom, um, when the event loop is closed, it, it, it says run forever, but if you send a, a, a kill signal, it will terminate. Um, at the end, it will send signals to clean everything up. And uh, the analyzers, <clears throat> they need that data uh, from the audio, uh, the audio signal. So uh, this is demonstrating how they can listen to Redis to hear that there is new data and to then get that data. Um, so it's relatively straightforward using AIO Redis to create this uh, publish subscribe model. So we have um, this uh, pub sub receiver uh, and we're connecting to Redis at localhost. As I said, it's super easy to just run, local, uh, run Redis in the background. And we subscribe to the audio channel and the control channel in this case. To get the messages, it's as easy as this for loop here. We sync for, and then you get a tuple of the channel and the message. So this MPSC object is listening for any event, any communication on either of those two channels. And anytime something comes in, then it executes the next line in this for loop. Then to, again, be flexible in our development, we defined an API contract by saying that every analysis needs to be a subclass of an analysis object. So BPM here is a, a subclass of analysis and tuner a subclass of analysis. And they all take uh, very similar parameters, which allow us to adjust um, the amount of data that goes in for every call, the frequency with which these analyses get called, et cetera. The analysis subclass takes care of uh, creating the views into memory um, under the hood. And then we can simply have uh, add in other services to these buses. So we can have a, a human control uh, an on-off switch somewhere. They could set up a, a clapper sensor that um, you know, sends a, a message on Redis and tells these services to uh, spin up or spin down. Um, also, uh, this is a, a, an add-on that we did uh, for visualizations. We ended up using uh, React and um, various JavaScript visualizations because there's, um, it's very flexible and easy to iterate with. Um, and we used WebSockets to communicate then between um, uh, the Python side and the, and the UI side. <clears throat> Again, there's an uh, async IO library for WebSocket communication, which makes that interface super easy. So all we do here uh, with the, the WebSocket is listen on the right channel on Redis, and anytime a message comes in, pass it on the WebSocket to the front end to make it pretty. So that was a rapid tour of a lot of different uh, technologies and approaches, but I hope you found it uh, entertaining at the very least and hopefully somewhat educational. Um, I'm very curious to hear what people uh, do with uh, edge computing and uh, really curious to see what the next thing is going to be with things like the Raspberry Pi. Um, that's all, thank you. Awesome. The uh, tough part about these virtual meetups is there's no applause for you afterwards, but I will, um, 
I, I can do it for you. I mean, I, I, that was <laughs> that was a fantastic presentation, Andrew. Um, so uh, it looks like we already have some questions in the chat. Um, this is when we would regularly be doing, you know, kind of our in-person Q and A. Um, so uh, uh, Andrew, I guess I can kind of read these out. So. Uh, will you talk in more detail about the hardware you use to support some of these Python libraries given their resource requirements? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, take it away. Yeah, um, a, <laughs> a uh, 2015 MacBook Pro um, with, uh, I think it was, I think it was either eight or 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, it wasn't like super beefy. So yeah, these, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, this is from George. Um, uh, this is from, yeah, George Soto. I don't yeah. know if you'll know. <laughs> George, I'm, I'm wondering if you can, um, uh, if you can say a little bit more about what where your concern would be in terms of, of uh, resource requirements. Um, where, where do you sense the computer would start melting? If you don't mind me putting you on the spot in a text channel. We can, yeah, we can wait for George's response, I suppose. Um, he, he uh, also another so there's a couple of questions coming in here, um, mm -hmm. which Andrew I think you can probably see on Zoom, right? We've all yeah, we've all drifted to becoming Zoom experts. Um, I, I mean, one of them I think is really I was wondering um, if you had or could put up some type of um, demo on like YouTube and we could share later or something like that because sure. it seems like um, I yeah maybe I'm just I'm very partial to like cool, neat things that happen on Raspberry Pi, <laughs> yeah. for instance, like, so um, I'm a sucker for that, but. Sure, so I, I have to uh, temporarily disappoint you there in okay. uh, that I can't easily demonstrate this. The, the um, project itself, um, we can't talk about, so. Um, I, okay. The visualizations that we have, um, I, I can't really show. I was hoping in advance of this to have a uh, demo on GitHub that people could run. Um, that's not there yet. Okay. I hope this isn't an empty promise, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, I'll email you every day and, and eventually. Okay. We'll, yeah. Uh, it looks like George, by the way, I'm, followed up <laughs> on your question. And Windows are useful too. Um, so could, so yeah, that's an open question for me. Can we use the Raspberry Pi for this? I think so. I did not run any specific benchmarks to see, um, <clears throat> to see if, um, you know, it, it would fit in Raspberry Pi's memory. Um, I suspect it would. I, but yeah, I can just give you that. I, I think it would work. I don't have the I don't have the details. Um, I do know that the uh, that you can run um, <clears throat> you can run a full Linux operating system with multiprocessing on um, on the latest Raspberry Pi, which really makes me think that this could be possible. Uh, so sorry, that's a non-answer, George. Um, and then uh, yeah, I'll read it off for the benefit of the. The, the attendees here. Um, did you did you use Redis? Or, I don't think you answered this. Did you use Redis on prem uh, only because of the client constraint? If there wasn't a constraint, what uh, what benefits would you have accrued running it on the cloud? I did not uh, see that question because I think I was looking at the wrong part of chat. So there's um, chat and there's Q and A. So we have things are going um, on. Yeah. You. All right. All right. Thank you. That's great. So, um, <clears throat> trying to figure out the right way to answer the question because um, we we used Redis on prem, but not only because of the client constraint. 
Um, I, I think it's a, a fabulous piece of technology. Uh, and uh, we could as well run Redis in the cloud. Redis um, can run in cluster mode. It's got um, a implementation of, of uh, raft consensus uh, that makes things work really well at, at a large scale. Um, I've been actually eyeing um, some test cases of using Redis as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to something like Kafka in the cloud because I think it could be um, just as fast, if not faster, and easier to set up and configure. This is going to be too, maybe too many details, but um, uh, Kafka uh, relies on Zookeeper under the hood. Uh, Zookeeper is running the consensus algorithm that is keeping all of the, the um, state of the cluster in, in sync for, for Kafka. And it's, it's cumbersome to set both up at the same time on something like Kubernetes, when Kubernetes has, it already has its own um, uh, um, synchronization protocol. Um, losing the thread there a little bit, sorry. That's okay, that's what happens to my brain when I try to think about Zookeeper as well. <laughs> Um, in, in any case, I, above my pay I mean, grade, but yeah, ultimately, I think um, uh, Redis would be a lot simpler to deploy on Kubernetes than Kafka. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Uh, no hands up. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, Andrew, I think you might be off the hook. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate, we really appreciate you uh, presenting um, and making this, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of keeping this community go even virtually. Um, so well, I, I'm uh, to everyone by the opportunity. Uh, I'll just kind of repeat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry to cut you off. Um, to everyone in attendance, uh, I was gonna say, uh, uh, this this uh, this presentation was recorded. We'll be posting that recording. It will be available through our um, through our Meetup page soon. Um, uh, you can submit feedback through our survey, and you can um, uh, if you have a, a talk you think would be interesting, go ahead and, and fill out our form there too. Um, all right. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you all so much. Bye, everyone.